So before we move on to the next part of uh, today's session, let's let's see uh, which one of these two options is the correct one. So did anybody of you have time to think about it during the break? All right, maybe maybe we can decide in a democratic way. So who thinks that the correct answer is the first one? So the one on the left. All right, who thinks that the correct answer is the one on the right? All right, great. So can you say why? All right, I see. That's a, well. That's a good argument. So, any other thoughts? All right, that's good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's perfect. So that that's maybe one of the simplest ways of uh, getting this. So you remember that the creation and annihilation operators had anti-commutation relations, and essentially, if you switch two operators that have different quantum numbers, you just get a minus sign. So you can just switch them on the right. You get the minus sign automatically. So this is going to be important for us because as you know, these kind of terms are superconducting terms, right? And what the term on the right actually means is that that superconducting order is odd in momentum space. This actually means is that when you switch momentum, you get minus the superconducting order that you had before. And let me emphasize that for the S-wave superconducting order that we were discussing before, this was not the case. It was uniform in momentum space. It was delta, a specific complex number in momentum space, and therefore it was even. So this superconducting order is going to be automatically odd just uh, from the algebraic properties of the creation and annihilation operators. And this is a spin triplet superconducting order, as we will see now. All right, great. So um, there was also a question in the chat, which is uh, how was the superconducting order in the honeycomb lattice? And let me answer that by saying that that is one of the exercises in the exercise session. So uh, one of the things that you have to see is how the band structure with superconductor in the honeycomb lattice looks like. All right, great. So now let us move on to unconventional superconductivity. So superconducting orders that are no longer S-way, that are no longer uniform momentum space, and that, that they can actually change sign and even change phase in momentum space. So the basic idea to understand unconventional superconductivity is just to think that in a generic Hamiltonian with superconductivity, we of course have our single particle electronic dispersion that is the same as before, but now we can have many times of different superconducting orders. So we can have C dagger up, C dagger up, or up, down, or down, down, and all, all the combinations of the yeah, of, of the of the different spins. And of course, if you write it in momentum spins, it's going to uh, look like this. So the, ba the basic idea is that for the simplest superconductor, that it's a single band superconductor, the superconducting order is not just a number, but it's actually a matrix. It's a matrix with the pairings in the up-up channel, down-down channel, up-down channel, and down-up channel. So for S-wave superconductivity, we were just considering these two terms here in the off-diagonal, so terms that involve C dagger up, C down. But now for spin triplet, we are going to consider these two in the diagonal and also some additional ones that also appear in the off-diagonal. So the basic idea is that if you want to fully characterize the superconducting order of a material, the only thing that you need to know is this matrix. If you know this matrix, and how it looks like in momentum space, you know almost everything that you would like to know about the superconducting order of your material. 
But now here's the trick. We usually don't even know this. So even if you think about the simplest unconventional superconductors, we usually don't are not even sure about what is the superconducting matrix that uh, accounts for their superconducting order. And of course, we don't know what is the mechanism leading to superconductivity. So in the case of S-wave superconductors, what we know is that, well, our superconductivity has, let's say, the same sign in momentum space. It may change, the magnitude may change a little bit. We have ser several bands, but it has the same sign. If we have a D-wave superconductor, what we know is that the off-diagonal terms here are going to be non-zero and the diagonal terms are going to be zero, and we may have some nodes in momentum space. But if you take an arbitrary unconventional superconductor that you know that it's not S wave and it may not be D wave, knowing exactly which terms in this superconducting matrix are non-zero, and even what is their dependence in momentum space is a question that it's completely open. And every material, it's a whole new world. Understanding the superconducting order in every material is a full, extremely challenging problem. But for us, what we are going to do is we are going to assume that we do know what is the superconducting matrix, and we are just going to see how the electronic structure behaves under different superconducting matrix, uh, either, let's say, spin singlet, superconductivity, triplet, nodal, gapped, and so forth. All right, great. So now the basic idea is that uh, when you have a superconducting order, in real space, and uh, before we were considering that our superconducting order uh, only coupled electrons and holes in, in the same lattice, but in general, it can couple electrons and holes in site R and site R prime. That essentially comes from this expectation value. We can, if we have translational symmetry, we can fully transform this uh, gap matrix and get to a gap matrix that now is momentum dependent. For every superconductors, uh, this was just a constant, right? But if we have a more unconventional superconducting order, this can change in momentum space in many different ways. So even if we think about the superconducting order that links spin up and spin down, we can already have many different gap matrices, delta up down of k. And essentially one of the simplest ideas is that a way to classify superconducting orders is just to expand this function in harmonics, namely L equal to zero, L equal to one, L equal to two, L equal to three, and so forth, in the very same way as we do in molecular physics. So for example, if your gap matrix is essentially L equal to zero, namely a constant, you say that you have an S-wave superconductor. If your superconducting order is L equal to one, so like, let's say, like P orbitals in a molecule, then you have P-wave superconductivity. If the expansion gives rise to L equal to two, namely D, like D orbitals in a molecule, then you have D wave superconductivity, L equal to three, F wave superconductivity, L equal to four, G wave superconductivity, and so forth. So all these names of S wave, P wave, D wave, A, G wave, F wave, and so forth, they just come from the expansion in momentum space of this matrix. All right, great. So that is one of the ingredients. So what is the angular momenta of the superconducting order. But then there's one more idea that we need to keep in mind, which is that we no we just no longer have delta up down, but we also have all the combinations of delta up up, delta down down, del and delta down down, right? And in particular, as we mentioned before, we can actually have two different symmetries in momentum space for the superconducting order, right? It may happen that uh, our system has uh, even symmetry in momentum space, namely that when we evaluate the superconducting order uh, in an opposite moment that we get the very same superconducting order, and in that case we call spin singlet. This is S-wave superconductors, T-wave superconductors, and so forth. And then what may also happen is that if we evaluate our superconducting order in a momenta that it's the opposite of our reference point, then we get a minus sign. And this is odd superconductivity, and it will give rise to spin triplet superconductor. So for example, the expectation value that we were discussing during the break is essentially one of the expectation values for a spin triplet superconductor. And let me emphasize that here, you not only have delta up, up but you also have delta down down, and you can also have the, a delta down up that is a spin triplet. All right, great. So then 
most of the materials that we understand fall in this class, spin singlet. So conventional superconductors, high temperature superconductors, uh, in particular cuprates, they are all spin singlet. So you can have spin singlet superconductors that are conventional or unconventional, but all the spin triplet superconductors are unconventional. And now, of course, one, one question is, well, how many spin triplet superconductors do we have in nature? And the answer to this is that not that many, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. So of course, we have these heavy fermion compounds that have spin triplet superconductivity and ferromagnetic superconductivity. Then we have uh, twisted graphene multilayers and, and that, yeah, and that's almost the, the whole story. So in the following, let, let us focus on how the electronic structure looks like between this singlet, triplet, nodal, and gap, and see what are the consequences of this. All right, great. So now let, let's look at a minimal example in which we can get unconventional superconductivity, and in particular, spin triplet superconductivity. And first of all, let me emphasize that this is one of the examples that we will do during the exercise session. So we are going to take a metal, but not a conventional metal. We are going to take a metal that is ferromagnetic, a metal that uh, where up electrons and down electrons are in equivalent and that has an exchange field. You can think that a way of generating this is by taking a two-dimensional material and applying an inkling magnetic field so that it couples to the Simon field, or you can take a two-dimensional material and put it on top of a 2D ferromagnet that also creates an exchange field due to proximity or any other strategy to create an exchange field. So the basic ingredients that we are going to put in our Hamiltonian is just kinetic energy. We are going to put exchange energy, that is just the Simon field or the exchange coupling, and then we are going to put attractive interactions. Uh, but now we are no longer going to put on-site attractive interactions, but just first neighbor attractive interactions. And then we solve this Hamiltonian at the main field level. So the basic idea is that if you start with the electronic structure of your uh, metal with an exchange field, what you have is that your up and down electrons are no longer to generate, but there is a splitting. And now let me emphasize one thing that is already important of, of this electronic structure. So for spin singlet superconductivity and for uh, S-wave superconductivity, one thing that is extremely important is something called Cramer's degeneracy, which is essentially the notion that for each electron at K with spin up, you have another electron at minus K with spin down. So this degeneracy that holds every time that you have time reversal symmetry and you need time reversal symmetry alone allows you to have spin singlet superconductivity just because spin singlet couples opposite spins at opposite momenta. So you may have materials that have extremely strong spin orbit coupling. It can break mirror symmetry or it can break just the inversion symmetry. But as long as you have time reversal symmetry, Cromer's degeneracy holds and superconductivity may happen. That is the reason why even in very heavy materials, like uh, uh, yeah, any, uh, any material that is very low in the periodic table, you can still have superconductivity even if spin orbit coupling effects are extremely large, just because you have Cromer's degeneracy. But an exchange field breaks Cromer's degeneracy. An exchange field breaks the degeneracy between up and down channels at opposite momenta. So in particular here, if you look at this momenta, uh, at zero energy, you have, let's say, down. But at the opposite momenta, you have down. What this actually means is that you cannot have Cooper pairs with up and down electrons, but your Cooper pairs now, they must be up and up electrons or down and down electrons. And this is what spin triplet superconductivity is. It's essentially Cooper pairs in which the total angular momenta of your Cooper pair is one, just because you, you have a, a triplet. All right, great. So now let, let's just solve this Hamiltonian at the mean field level. So first we just set up our Nambu spinner and we set up the Nambu spinner. We just get two different copies of our electronic structure, right? The blue bands are essentially the whole part of our Hamiltonian, the red, bands are the electron part of the Hamiltonian. So when we don't have interactions whatsoever, we just have a metal, we have a full gap. But now if we introduce interactions, what we actually see is that a gap develops in this electronic structure. And let me emphasize 
that in this Hamiltonian, I am not introducing superconductivity explicitly. What I am just introducing is kinetic energy, exchange interactions, and attractive interactions. And when you introduce these three ingredients together, superconductivity arises by itself in the very same way than when you didn't have exchange interactions and just uh, attractive on-site interaction, s way superconductivity arises by itself. So what you see in this electronic structure is that now you, of course, have anti-crossings between uh, what the up bands and down bands were. But the first thing that you notice is that the anti-crossings have different magnitudes. So here, there's a very large anti-crossing. Here, there's a very small anti-crossing. What this actually means is that the pairing between up electrons is different than the pairing between down electrons. So you have a very strong bonding between up, uh, up electrons in compared pairs and a weaker bonding between down and down electrons. So th this type of superconductivity is first, spin triplet, and it is also what is called non-unitary superconductivity. So we are not going to enter into much detail later on, but let me just emphasize that even when you classify superconducting orders in odd parity spin triplet, you can still have more unconventional orders. So among them, you can have non-unitary. And if you have multi-orbital, you can have inter-orbital inter pairing and, and so forth. All right, great. So now let us look at some consequence of this spin triplet superconductivity. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking this very same electronic structure. Instead of considering a two-dimensional uh, superconductor, I am putting it in a one-dimensional strip. So I'm going, I'm making just a ribbon of our 2D superconductor. And when you take, let's say, that superconductor that came with the exchange field and that was driven by attractive interactions, and you put it in a ribbon in a system that it's infinite in the x direction, what you actually see is that there's a gap, which is the same gap that you had in the bulk, but now there are two states that kind of cross the gap. And let me emphasize that the colors here mean upper edge, lower edge, and bulk. So blue here is the upper edge, red is the lower edge, and gray is the bulk of the system. So what you actually see is that in this superconducting state, there is a gap in the bulk, but there are also states that propagate in the up edges and in the down edges. And this is just an example of something called a topological superconductor. And we will go into detail a little bit more uh, later on and also in the, in the last lecture about topology. But let me, at this stage, let me just emphasize that you can have superconducting orders that have topological excitation, that have excitations that appear on the edges and that you cannot remove by putting impurities or by changing your edge and so forth. And spin triplet superconductors are one specific example of this. Is there a like gap? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So, um, of course, it depends on how you define gap, right? So, if you call superconducting gap the gap that you observe in the bulk, then yes, there there is a superconducting gap. Then if you call superconducting gap to the gap of the whole system, including the edges, then there's not a superconducting gap. So for, for example, if you study thermal transport in this system, what you will see is that your system is gapless because heat can also go through the edges. If you do a spectroscopy with an STM locally, what you will see is that here there's a gap and here there isn't. Yeah, that, that was a really good question. Thanks. All right, great. So now let, let us focus just on, uh, let's say, spin singlet superconductivity. So what I showed you before was spin triplet. So a superconducting state in which the order parameter that we have is delta up, up, and delta down, down. But let us now move back to spin singlet. And in particular, let's talk all the time about this delta up, down of K. And let me just distinguish two completely different cases in this term that in principle, it looked like trivial. So we can have superconducting orders in which this superconducting order parameter 
is finite in the whole momentum space. And that is the case uh, that we discussed at the very beginning, which the gap function was uniform and essentially gave rise to a fully gapped electronic structure. This is the case, for example, of niobium diselenide. So this monolayer that at very monolayer van der Waals material that at very low temperatures develops a gap. So this gap in principle can be understood as an S-wave superconducting gap. But then you can also have gaps that are delta up down, but that they have nodes in the balloon zone. So namely that uh, you have a finite gap in some parts of the balloon zone, but in others, it just becomes zero. It can become zero for, un, uh, for symmetry reasons, or it, it can be just, um, uh, yeah, just a, a degeneracy that, that happens and that it's not kind of protected, but that you can move in the balloon zone. And this is the case, for example, of twisted graphene trilators, where there have been experimental signatures of nodal superconductivity. All right, so that, that is the, the first thing. And now those two superconducting orders that I mentioned can be classified according to what is the symmetry that they have. So for example, the delta up down that I mentioned before can be either in the S wave channel or it can be in the D wave channel if it is spin singlet. If it is a spin triplet, it's going to be in the P wave channel. And let's say that there's a certain relation that has been, uh, let's say, su suggested between what is the symmetry of the superconducting order and what is the mechanism that gives rise to the superconducting order. Let me emphasize that these relations can be violated in many different cases. So don't take this as a rule, but quite often if you have s wave superconductivity, you can say that it's driven by phonons or it is likely to be driven by phonons. If you have P wave superconductivity, it is likely to be driven by ferromagnetic fluctuations. Again, it doesn't have to, but there are some examples that are believed to, to be the case. And if you have D wave superconductivity, it is believed to be driven by antiferromagnetic magnons, but again, it also doesn't have to be the case. So you can think about examples in which let's say S wave super, in which phonon drive D wave superconductivity, you have competing interactions and so forth. So there are many counter examples, but let's just take this as a reference of which mechanisms can be responsible of which pairing channel. All right, great. So now let's look at different superconducting orders that we can have in the square lattice and that are spin singlet. So all these orders are delta up down. So these maps here are maps in reciprocal space. So this is Kx and Ky, the gamma point is right in the middle. So if we have an S-wave pairing, we have maybe the simplest superconducting order, right? So it's just an order that it's constant in the whole Brillon zone. So we have just the very same value, which is the uh, superconducting order that we consider at the beginning. Now, if we have a nodal order that it's a spin singlet, such as a D-wave order, then the map looks like this. So we have a node at the gamma point that, uh, that it's blue. Then we also uh, have a maximum at some point in the Brillon zone. And then there, there's, of course, a fourfold rotational symmetry because we are thinking about this square lattice. So this superconducting order here in particular is a D-way superconducting order and called DX square minus Y square. And this nomenclature is essentially the very same nomenclature that you have in molecular physics, for example. So the orbitals that we have in molecules can be labeled according to the spherical harmonic. This is essentially the spherical harmonic, the x square, y square. And you can recognize that this is very, very similar to what we have in molecules for these orbitals. So in particular, if you put signs here, this will be plus, this will be minus, this will be plus, this will be, this will be minus, right? And since the signs alternate two times as we go around the gamma point, this is L equal to two. So what is important of this order is that first it has nodes, right? So these nodes are going to appear in this direction of the Brillouin zone and in this other direction in the Brillouin zone. So in particular, in the uh, kx equal to ky and kx equal to minus ky. So if you have a Fermi surface here around the gamma point, no matter what is the radius of your Fermi surface, you always are going to have a node, right? Because you are go always going to intersect kx equal to ky and kx equal to minus ky. So a single uh, a band around the gamma point for this superconducting order 
give rise to a nodal superconducting order with spin singlet symmetry. So this was L equal to zero, L equal to two, but now let me show you that you can also have L equal to zero and nodal at the same time. So this is still an S-wave superconducting order parameter. And when I say S-wave, what I mean is that uh, essentially the uh, there's no winding of the phase as you go around the, the gamma point. So for example, now you have a maximum at the gamma point. So if your Fermi pocket is right here in the middle, then you have all the time the very same superconducting order. But then at some point in the Brillouin song, you essentially have a node. And then it becomes positive again. So this kind of superconductivity is also S-wave superconductivity. It is a little bit unconventional because it's it can be nodal. It doesn't have to. It depends on how your Fermi surface is. So if your Fermi surface is very, very close to the gamma point, then you have a full gap. But if then it happens to intersect some of the nodes that you have, then you become nodal. So S-wave superconductivity, L equal to zero, and yet nodal. So these are just three different examples of spin singlet superconductors, fully gapped, nodal no, ma no matter what, and nodal depending on details. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, that's a, a very good question. So you can think that it's something like um, constant uh, minus k square, for example. So if you write a superconducting order parameter, um, yeah, then let me. Yeah, so if you write a superconducting order parameter that essentially looks like this, this is, let's say, even in momentum space, this is rotationally symmetric. So it's S wave, and, and yet you, you, get, you can get a zero. So you can think that the superconducting order parameter is characterized by the expansion in spherical harmonics, but also the expansion in terms of radial function, right? So you can expand delta k in terms of how it depends on the angular momenta, but also how it depends on the modula, moduli of k. Usually we don't care too much about the moduli of k, right? But for extended S-wave, the moduli of k matters, let's say. So this is kind of L, L equal to zero. And if you think in terms of, uh, let's say, quantum numbers of molecules, this would be N equal to two, let's say. So uh, let's say this type of superconductivity of extended S-wave, for example, appears in, in one material that can be grown in the monolayer form, uh, which is iron selenide. So iron selenide has a nodal superconducting order uh, and that it's also nematic, but it is believed to be an extended S-wave superconducting order. Yeah, great, that, that was a very good question. All right, great. So now let, let's look at superconducting orders, not in the square lattice, uh, but now in the triangular lattice, which is kind of the type of lattice that you, we usually encounter in two-dimensional materials. So if you think about, let's say, niobium diselenide, twisted graphene multilayers, and uh, many other dichalcogenides, then the lattices that we have are usually triangular. And therefore, if we want to understand superconducting order for 2D materials, it's good to focus on the, the symmetries of these triangular lattices. So let me now here emphasize three different superconducting orders. So the first one is the S-wave superconducting order that it is as uh, interesting or, well, as not interesting as in the square lattice. So just a uniform pairing the whole Brillouin zone. There's no change in the uh, absolute value of the superconducting order. It's just a constant. But then we can have a nodal F-wave pairing. Let me emphasize that this is still a delta up-down pairing. But now it is no longer in the singlet channel but it's actually in the triplet channel. And we, you can experiment about this order later on during the exercise session. So what, what is important about this order is that again, it is zero at the gamma point and it is zero at the time reversal invariant points of the Brillouin zone. So the points that are their own time reversal symmetric just because it's a spin triplet. And then it takes a maximum value somewhere in the Brillouin zone. 
So for this type of nodal F-wave ordering, we have a very similar phenomenology as in the case of extended S-wave. We can have a fully gapped system or we can have a nodal system. So if we have just pockets around the K point and the K prime point, then we are fully gapped, right? Because our pocket has finite superconductivity at K, finite superconductivity at K prime, full gap, no nodes whatsoever. But now if we have a pocket around the gamma point, then at that stage, we can get nodes, especially because in this line here, so in these three lines that got the Brunel zone, we have an exact zero value. And actually, if you look at the specific signs of this F-wave ordering, you have plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And therefore, if you have alternation between plus and minus, you must have a node in the middle. So F-wave ordering is also a very important ordering for uh, 2D materials. And you may be fully gapped or gapless, depending on how your electronic structure looks like. Yeah, so that's a very good question. And mm, I would say that they they don't have specific physical meaning, but it actually comes from how your expansion in terms of momentum of your superconducting order is. So let's say, for example, if you think about the D wave superconducting order, then for that superconducting order, you can write something like, Let's say k x square minus k y square. If you expand the superconducting order around the gamma point, and th this delta function can be positive, can be negative, can have an arbitrary, uh, let's say, phase, right? Oh, thanks. Uh, and then depending on in which direction you look in the Brillouin zone, you may have something that is completely positive if you look in the x direction, something that is completely negative if you look in the y direction, or something that, that is zero. And uh, let me emphasize that every time that I write that some superconducting order like this, I mean, you could multiply this by any arbitrary phase that you want. So yeah, you can put here any phase. So the, the specific plus and minus do, doesn't have a meaning. What has a meaning is the relative phase or sign yeah, between some parts of the real zone and, and others. So usually for simplicity, we say that this phase is zero here because we, we need to make a choice, but in principle, you can put any phase. And what is important is that the, si the signs and the phases of the superconducting order change as you wind in the real zone, very much like the orbitals in a molecule. You can actually study it by the amazing grain boundary function. Yeah, yeah. So you have uh, one grain which is one orientation, another other orientations, you put them together and then you study the the spectrum so for one day of phase you have a grain. Yeah, which is kind of one way of making interference between one of some direction of the real song and, and another direction. Yeah, that's a very nice point. All right, great. So Oh, uh, the one that I forgot. So the extended S-wave pairing in the triangular lattice. So for this pairing, we have a situation that is very similar as in the square lattice. So depending on how our Fermi pocket is, we can have a full gap or a nodal gap. So again, extended S-wave is spin singlet L equal to zero, and it may be gapped, it may be nodal, depending on how your Fermi surface is. Okay, so now let, let us look just at two electronic structures with superconductivity that look very, very, very similar, actually. So the first one is just an S-wave superconducting order. So a superconducting order that is essentially uniform in momentum space. And we take this electronic structure, it opens a gap here and opens a gap there. So this is conventional spin singlet superconductivity. And now let me also show you how the electronic structure looks like for a superconducting order that it's called chiral Q wave. So at this stage, the only thing that it's important is that this is a superconducting order with L equal to one. So it's a P wave order. So now my question for you is, do you see any difference between these two? Apart from, of course, very small, teeny tiny changes in the gap. Do you see any difference in the bands? So both are gapped, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a a bit bigger. So of course, I, I could have chosen exactly the values that give rise to the to the same gap. Yeah, 
Yeah, there, there was one question in the chat, I think. Um, let me check. Yeah, so they, they also mentioned that the size of the gap is slightly different. So, all right, I should have made a gap much, much more similar to make the question more difficult. But yeah, besides the size of the gap that can be controlled, I mean, there is effectively no difference in this spectral function, right? Uh, the only difference that you see is on this thing here that I wrote churn number that I have not mentioned so far, right? So what it's important is that you can have superconducting orders that have very, very similar electronic structures and that when you, let's say, compute the electron spectral function or even when you do tunneling of them, they look exactly the same. So if you do tunneling in a two-dimensional material with this order, you see exactly the same as if you do tunneling in a two-dimensional material with this order, but they have radically different properties. And in particular, the way in which we can distinguish them is through something that it's called a topological invariant. And that for this case is a Cher number that it's zero. And for this case is a Cher number that it's equal to minus two. All right, good. So I said that this, bands look very similar and yet they are very different, but I still didn't tell you why they are different. Why shouldn't we consider them that are exactly the same? So the actual trick is that if instead of considering a two-dimensional superconductor, you think about a strip of this superconductor, so a superconductor that is infinite in the x direction and has finite edges, very much like the ribbons that we considered yesterday, you actually see a very big difference between these two superconducting orders. So for the S-wave superconducting order, would you actually see that there's a gap everywhere in your Bidon zone and for every single state that appears in your strip? But if you look at the chiral B-wave order, what actually happens is that you still see the bulk gap, that is the very same bulk gap that appeared in the electronic structure before, but now there are two states that are gapless and one state that is located in the upper part of the strip and one state that it's located in the lower part of the strip. And essentially, this difference on the number of edge states, it's related with this topological invariant that I mentioned before, the Cher number. So again, we will go into detail uh, about this in the fifth session. Uh, at this stage, what it's important to mention is that just by looking at the bands in a superconductor, you don't know everything about the superconducting state. You know some things, you know, if your system is gapped, or gapless, but you don't know if your system is topologically trivial or topologically non-trivial. And maybe what is more important for superconductivity, you don't know anything about the uh, symmetry of your superconducting order. So in particular, this is an L equal to zero superconducting order, whereas this is an L equal to one superconducting order. And what's even more important is that this superconducting order doesn't break the universal symmetry. It's a conventional superconducting order, whereas this superconducting order does break the universal symmetry in a very, very subtle way. So it's not the time reversal symmetry breaking that we usually think in magnetism, but still breaks time reversal symmetry. So through some kind of internal orbital current associated to the superconducting state. All right, great. So now we already know a little bit something about unconventional superconductors. So maybe it is a good time to move on to how do we modify superconductors? And, and in particular, as we discussed yesterday, one of the ways of modifying two-dimensional materials is through absorbance, through impurities. And in particular, in 2D materials, we can put different types of impurities, right? Yesterday, we discussed the hydrogen atoms in graphene. But if you think about two-dimensional two superconductors like the nanogenide selenide, you can start putting different types of absorbance on top of nanogenide selenide. You can decide putting non-magnetic impurities just to see if something changes. You may decide on putting magnetic impurities. And the same applies also to any twisted graphene multilayer or to any van der Waals heterostructure that combines superconductors with magnets. So that is essentially the idea that we are going to explore now. So we are going to take a 2D superconductor with different pairing symmetries, can be uh, singlet, triplet, nodal, gapped, and so forth. And we are going to see what happens once we introduce an impurity. So this impurity can be a magnetic impurity or a non-magnetic impurity. 
All right, and yesterday, actually, we, we saw that when we take just graphene and we put a hydrogen atom, the electronic structure changes dramatically, right? And I mean, graphene is kind of a very simple material and just by putting there a non-magnetic impurity, the density of states dramatically changed. So it was absolutely different. So let's say if you ask me at this stage, I would say that putting non-magnetic impurities in superconductors is going to change the electronic structure just in a really, really remarkable way. It's going to give rise to a completely different spectra. So I really cannot wait to see how the electronic structure of superconductors changes when I put an impurity there. All right, so let's start with the simplest uh, superconductors. And in particular, I am going to consider four different cases. So first, let's put just a non-magnetic impurity. Then let's put a single magnetic impurity and then just put several non-magnetic impurities and then several uh, magnetic impurities. And so let's start with the simplest case. So let's take a non-magnetic impurity and an S-wave superconductor. And as we, as we mentioned, well, if in the absence of superconductivity, an impurity creates such a huge change in graphene for superconductors that are way more unconventional, this is going to be way more awesome. So let's see what happens. Oh. Okay, all right. That, that's not too remarkable. So here in the left, you see how the density of states looks like in the absence of a magnetic impurity. So this is a pristine superconductor. The gap here that you see is the superconducting gap. And now if you put a non-magnetic impurity, then you see something that it's very, very similar, right? And one can even think that maybe I copied the same image twice, but actually I, I didn't. So these are the calculations for a system with superconductivity, no impurities and superconductivity and a single impurity. So what actually happens is that if you take a conventional S-wave superconductor and you put impurities that are non-magnetic, essentially nothing, nothing changes. So you still have a gap. Your gap doesn't change almost anything. And uh, you can almost not distinguish between a system that has impurities and doesn't have impurities. And let me emphasize that this is not this is not an accident. This is actually a consequence of what we mentioned before, the Kramer's degeneracy. And in particular, this is one of the fundamental consequences of something called Anderson's theorem, which essentially tells you that if you have a superconductor that it's singlet S wave and with the gap uniform in momentum space, weak scattering disorder. So scattering that doesn't break the inversal symmetry is not detrimental for your superconducting state. And the reason why this happens is even though is because even though impurities mix your different momenta, they do not break the inversal symmetry. They do not break the degeneracy between up electrons are plus K and down electrons at minus k. And as long as you don't break that degeneracy, superconductivity, in particular S-wave superconductivity, does not get affected. So for example, a very simple way of knowing if you have an S-wave superconductor or not, is that you take your 2D superconductor, you start putting non-magnetic impurities, and if nothing happens, then you may have an S-wave superconductor. If something happens, you may have an unconventional superconductor. All right, good. So this was the first case. So a non-magnetic impurity in a conventional superconductor. And let me emphasize that this is, for example, the case uh, that you get when you put any type of ad atom on niobium diselenide. So it can be silicon ad atoms. You can make, let's say, replacements of niobium by some other atom and so forth, as long as it is a non-magnetic atom. So in those cases, you still see a superconducting gap but you didn't get any too dramatic changes when you put a single impurity. Now, if you consider, let's say, many different impurities, and here what I'm doing is I'm considering just a big supercell of a superconductor and putting non-magnetic disorder all over the supercell, what actually happens is something very, very similar. So on the left, you have the electronic structure in the absence of disorder. On the right, you have the electronic structure in the presence of disorder. And first, let, let me emphasize that these are not self-consistent calculations. So here we are just putting the uh, superconducting order kind of by hand. If we did a self-consistent calculation, the result may change a little bit, but still uh, it's not going to change too, too much. 
So what is important here is that even if you put several impurities in your superconductor, in a spin singlet superconductor, you still don't see any substantial change on your gap. And this, of course, what happens if you have some impurities in conventional superconductors. So, so that's why dirty superconductors that have a few impurities that are non-magnetic are still superconducting. And they are not, let's say, too sensitive to non-magnetic disorder, as long as you don't destroy the electronic structure, of course. All right, good. So now let us move on to the next case that is slightly more uh, interesting. So we are still going to take an S-wave superconductor, so now you have the selenide, but now instead of putting a non-magnetic impurity, we are going to put a magnetic impurity. And by magnetic impurities, you can think about any 3D atom. It could be cobalt, nickel, iron, or even any molecule that has a finite spin like a talosanine and so forth. So on the left, you have the density of states in the absence of the impurity. So you still your S-wave superconducting gap. And now when you put a single magnetic impurity, now you do see that there's something inside the gap. So now this magnetic impurity creates an in-gap state inside the superconductor. And let me emphasize that this in-gap state is again a consequence of Kramer's degeneracy. But now the consequence is that the magnetic impurity does break Kramer's degeneracy. So a magnetic impurity essentially creates an exchange field that promotes one spin channel over the other. And you can think that this local exchange field is kind of breaking a little bit a Cooper pair. So usually one way to think about the superconducting gap is to say that this energy difference between zero and the superconducting delta is the energy that you need to pay to break a Cooper pair in a fully gapped S-wave superconductor. Now, if you have a magnetic impurity, the magnetic impurity kind of helps you to break one of the Cooper pairs. So the magnetic impurity kind of gives, gives some energy to the Cooper pair. And then if you want to break it completely, you just have to give a little bit more energy that is smaller than the superconducting gap. And let me emphasize that actually this has a very uh, important consequence. And th there's a question in the chat, which is, does it, so is it like a Van Hoff singularity? And I, I think that the, the way to understand this state is that this is a, a single state. So it's a bound state. So we don't have a bound structure or an electronic structure. This is just a, a single state. And the reason why you see a finite width is because in the calculations, we usually put a finite imaginary time in the Green's function. But this should be a state that it's uh, infinitely sharp. Let's say if we consider an infinite lifetime. So this has a, a very important consequence, actually. So uh, I mentioned now that if you think about this magnetic impurity helping you break a Cooper pair, you can actually be in two different situations, right? So you can be in a situation in which the magnetic impurity helps you break a Cooper pair, but the Cooper pair is no totally broken yet, and you need to give some energy to completely break it. Or if the magnetic impurity is very, very strong, it can happen that the impurity alone breaks a Cooper pair, and your ground state is just a bunch of Cooper pairs plus some unpaired electron that it was the former electron of the Cooper pair that got broken, right? And this transition between a Cooper pair that is almost broken to a Cooper pair that is completely broken is what is called the parity switching point. And let me show you how that looks like. So here, Oh, so uh, so there's one question in chat, which is how do we put spectral broadening in a real system? So, and this is a, a very good question. So you can think that spectral broadening is some kind of lifetime that your particles have. So for example, if you couple any system to a metallic lead, the coupling to the metallic lead is going to give rise to some intrinsic lifetime. So for example, if you think about a two-dimensional uh, superconductor, if you put this two-dimensional superconductor on top of a metal, then your in gap states are going to be a certain lifetime that it's related with, uh, with the coupling between the superconductor and the, met and the metal. If in comparison you put this two dimensional material on top of an insulator, then the lifetime of your in gap states is going to become much, much, much bigger just because they don't have anywhere to go. So if you have met a metal, your in any electron that tunnels into this resonant mode can go afterwards to the metal. If you have an insulator, it cannot go anywhere. So it will stay inside the superconductor 
forever, or as long as it finds somewhere to go. So essentially, by choosing different substrates, you can control what is the lifetime of those bomb states. So in terms of two-dimensional materials, if you put niobium disenonide on top of hexagonal boron nitrate, you are going to have a very large lifetime. If you put it on top of more niobium diselenide or any other 2D metal, then your lifetime is probably going to be smaller. All right, great. So now let, let us look at uh, the very same density of states that I showed you before, but now at many of them at the same time. So now in the y-axis, we have the energy, and in the x-axis, we have the exchange coupling. So this J essentially controls how strong this uh, magnetic impurity is affecting the two-dimensional electron gas. And you can think that this J essentially controls a Siemens coupling to the, uh, to the superconductor. So if you are at J equal to zero, this is like not having a magnetic impurity, and therefore you have a full gap. Now, if you start increasing the value of the exchange coupling, then suddenly you start getting an in-gap state. So the very same in-gap state that you saw before, that was this nearly broken Cooper pair, uh, and that it's, uh, these states are usually called Yushiva Rusino states. And then once you go to a critical value of your exchange coupling, suddenly your two peaks collide. And afterwards, uh, yeah, your two peaks continue evolving. So what is important for us is that this colliding of peaks is not just some arbitrary degeneracy, but it actually marks a transition in the many body state of the superconductor. So in particular, when you are at J equal to zero, you can consider that all the electrons in the Fermi surface are paired. So each electron is paired with another one, and therefore your superconductor has an even number of electrons. It's a combination of n plus n, n plus two, n plus four, and, and so forth, but it's an even number of electrons. Now, when you go through this point, then one of the Cooper pairs gets completely broken, and your ground state now consists on a set of Cooper pairs that give rise to an even number of electrons plus an electron that it's completely decoupled from the rest, that it's kind of alone and it doesn't have another pair. So in this case, you have a superconducting state that has an odd, uh, odd parity. So this transition essentially marks this many-body transition in a superconducting state. So magnetic impurities can actually drive a full many-body transition in a superconducting state. But if you have full magnetic Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So let me ask you. So any thoughts of what happens when you have two magnetic impurities? Yeah, same J or different J? Yeah, let's say both of them are J equal to three. Maybe on the yeah. Yeah. Right, so we have two possible scenarios, so it happens, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's a very good thought. So, any others? All right. So, let me start with this. So, if the impurities are far enough from each other, then the, the picture that we will see should be reasonably similar to, to this one, right? Now, if they start becoming closer and closer, right, there, there may be some, let's say, hybridizations between the two different branches, right? Um, all right, so the way to answer this question is that you can actually try it during the afternoon. So in, in we have one example that is exactly to compute this, you can try to put two magnetic impurities in your supercell and, and see what happens. And what you will see is that there are still crossing points as a function of j. So there will be several now, but there, there are still crossing points. 
Um, uh, sorry, can you say it again? Yeah, that's a very good point. So, I mean, both cases work. So you can think that the different magnetic impurities are the same atom. So one cobalt atom here and one cobalt atom there, but they can also be different. So it can be one cobalt atom here and one nickel atom there. And of course, if they are the same, the value of J is going to be the same. If they are different, the value of J is likely to be different. Yeah, that's also a very good point. So if you have a non-magnetic impurity, the non-magnetic impurity is not going to create a bound state, and only the magnetic impurity is going to create one bound state. So what actually happens if you put a non-magnetic impurity and a magnetic impurity is that you get a usually varus of state, let's say at different energies, but that has kind of different amplitudes for the electron and hole sector. So adding a non-magnetic scattering to a uh, system that has superconductivity and magnetic scattering actually breaks the electron hole symmetry of your juicy Barosinov states. And also that is also one of the exercises for the afternoon. So to see what happens if you change the uh, non-magnetic scattering potential. So you will see that the height of this peak sign that you choose for your non-magnetic scattering, you can have uh, yeah, the, this one negative bigger or the one positive bigger. I may continue at three, but the question is if they are one meter apart, you know, and both of them, uh, let's say, you, you say that there is no average, so that they are so far. However, you say that like, in both cases, you have to have an odd number of electrons, but in some region, but odd plus odd is interesting. So, so, but I, so actually, I don't know the answer to this uh, question, but what might Yes, it's actually the, the different energy difference between odd and even really depend on the size of your uh, sort of sample with, within which you have a similar experience. And, uh, and, and then in this one meter case, uh, basically, there is no such big difference. You know. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good point, actually. So, yeah, of course, when when they are close to each other, there will be an energy difference. Yeah. But then as you make them farther and farther from each other, that energy difference, of course, is going to become smaller and smaller. Yeah. We don't know whether it's up or even at the moment. The if there are two magnetic impurities which are far apart. So it's so if both of them coupled very strongly, it's going to be even, I would say. Right? Uh, the, 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 yeah. Only when you have the odd number of magnetic fields, you can have the like much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, experimentally, you are thinking, right? You. Yeah, that's a very good question. And the short answer is from the spectra alone, you can't. Because from the spectra alone, this, this looks exactly the same. So if you sit here, you are in the, uh, let's say, odd. If you sit here, you are in the even. So, and the peaks here are very similar to the peaks there. Of course, what you could try to do is to kind of push your, uh, impurity or your molecule towards the material. And when you push it towards the material, you are likely to increase the value of J, right? So if you push the magnetic impurity towards your material and you see that the peaks come closer together, you say, oh, I am actually on this side of the phase diagram. If you push your, mo your atom or your molecule towards the material and, it, they and the peaks become farther apart, then you would say that you are in the odd part. And something that I forgot to, to mention is that when I call this even and this odd, I also mean that the spin of the many modic ground state is zero here and one half here. So zero here means that you have an even number of electrons and if you have an even number of electrons, you can have spin equal to zero. And of course, if you have an odd number of electrons, then you, you must have spin one half, no matter which combination you, you choose. And that is essentially the same as saying that on this side of the phase diagram, you have one electron that is completely 
I'm Barrett. All right, good. So now let us move on to see what happens if we put several magnetic impurities in an S-wave superconductor. So a single magnetic impurity essentially creates an in-gap state. So if you now start adding more and more magnetic impurities to an S-wave superconductor, what actually happens is that you uh, very much affect the superconducting gap that you have. So here at the beginning, we start with a certain superconducting gap in the absence of magnetic impurities. And as you add more and more magnetic impurities, you start populating more and more states, or you start creating more and more states inside the gap. So in other words, magnetic impurities in S-wave superconductors are extremely detrimental to the superconducting order. And this is, again, because it breaks Cromer's degeneracy, because it breaks the Cooper pairs. And in particular, the higher the density of magnetic impurities, the smaller your gap is going to become. And eventually, you can completely destroy your superconducting state just by adding more and more magnetic impurities. And this type of superconductor that has uh, several magnetic impurities has a density of states that is not as sharp as a magnetic superconductor, and it is what it's called a Dines superconductor. So it's a superconducting state, but has a very, very soft gap with a, even sometimes with a finite amount of states inside the gap. All right, good. So all this was about conventional superconductor. So in short, no magnetic impurities do anything, uh, don't do anything to, to conventional superconductors, and magnetic impurities are extremely detrimental. Now let us move on to unconventional superconductors. And this unconventional superconducting order that I'm choosing here is this chiral P wave order that we mentioned before. So the electronic structure was very much the same, right? So we had a gap for S wave, a gap for chiral P wave. And from the electronic structure alone, we couldn't distinguish anything. And if you look now here at the density of states, you essentially see that you have a full gap in the density of states in the absence of any impurity. Now, the very interesting thing is that if you take this unconventional superconducting state and start putting impurities right where when you put a non-magnetic impurity, you suddenly get an in-gap state. So for unconventional superconductors, putting non-magnetic impurities is extremely detrimental. And this is actually a very simple way of identifying an unconventional superconductor. And this is actually a feature of any unconventional superconductor with non-S-wave superconducting order. If you put a non-magnetic impurity in an unconventional superconductor, you will always create an in-gap state. And the reason is actually fairly simple. So in an unconventional superconductor, you have a pairing matrix that changes sign in reciprocal space, right? It can change from plus to minus, or it can even have certain different phases in momentum space. When you put a non-magnetic impurity, what you are actually doing is just to mix different parts of momentum space. So you are averaging over momentum space. And if you average something that is plus and minus over momentum space, you get zero. If you average something that winds in momentum space, you also get zero. So every time that you put a non-magnetic impurity on a superconducting order that changes in momentum space and has signs in momentum space, you are going to decrease the superconducting order. And that is the reason why you get in-gap states in this unconventional superconductor. And this has been one of the most systematic ways of finding unconventional superconductivity, putting impurities, non-magnetic impurities, and seeing if in-gap states appear. And you can also think that this is one of the reasons why finding natural and conventional superconductors is so much more challenging than conventional ones. So of course, if you go to a lab and you take a crystal or a solid, they are going to have defects, right? They are going to have uh, domain walls. You may even have dopants, any kind of sorts of impurities and so forth. And all those perturbations are perturbations that act as non-magnetic impurities. In the, in the best case scenario, for conventional superconductors, that's absolutely okay. Non-magnetic impurities are not detrimental for superconductivity. And even if your 2D material is a little bit dirty, you still see superconductivity. But if your superconducting state is actually unconventional, then the more impurities you have, the more your superconducting uh, state is going to be killed, no matter how your impurity is. What this actually means is that 
to see unconventional superconductivity, you need to have samples that are the cleanest in any possible way that you may imagine in terms of doping walls, in terms of any kind of impurity, in terms of any kind of dopant, in terms of any kind of twin boundary and so forth, any kind of non-magnetic scattering is going to destroy an unconventional superconducting state. And there was a question in the chat, I think. Yeah, so uh, there's a question about the concentration of, of impurities uh, that well it, that matter for these systems. So, of course, in the case of unconventional superconductors, the more impurities you have, the yeah the more detrimental to your unconventional superconducting state. And regarding what is the concentration of impurities, this is a materials dependent question. So some superconducting states may still exist if you have, let's say, something like 1% impurities, but others may very, very quickly disappear. So there's no universal answer to this. What is universal is that impurities are usually detrimental to any unconventional superconducting state, and how detrimental and how quickly they quench the superconducting state depends on details of the electronic structure. Yeah, so let's say the location of these states essentially depends on what is the value of this potential. So if the value of this potential is very small, these states appear very close to the gap. If it is big, it, they appear here. So uh, let's say the, these states do not appear at a very specific energy, but it depends on how strong your impurity is in, in general, let's say. So it works very much in the same way as J here, that as a function of your impurity scattering, your impurity state appears closer or further apart. All right, great. So what this actually means is that if you now take an unconventional superconductor, this chiral P wave superconductor, and you start adding uh, a lot of non-magnetic disorder, you very quickly get in gap state. So you very quickly lose the superconducting gap that you originally had in the, in the Brillouin song. And this is essentially, as I mentioned before, what makes finding unconventional superconductors challenging from the materials point of view, in a sense that we need extremely clean samples to see superconductivity and an unconventional uh, superconducting state. All right, good. So this appearance of in gap states is not unique to gapped unconventional superconductors. So as we mentioned before, unconventional superconductivity can be gapped or can be gapless. And if it is gapless, you still see in-gap states. Of course, they appear in a slightly different way, but they still appear when you add a non-magnetic scattering. So here I am showing you a nodal superconducting state with a slightly complicated electronic structure. But what is important is that in this system, you have gaps in some parts of the Brillouin zone and not in others. And when you have a, a superconducting state like that, essentially your density of states takes a V shape, like so very similar as in graphene. But uh, now this V shape is not related with drag cones, but rather just with nodes in momentum space. So now the idea is that if you put also a non magnetic scattering for a nodal superconductor, you also see an in-gap state, just because a nodal superconductor is also an unconventional superconductor. It also has gaps that change sign in different parts of the Brillouin zone. And this is, for example, so something that can uh, that is very well known in, in cuprate. So if you take these nodal superconductors and you start putting vacancies or impurities, you very quickly see these in-gap states coming there. This is also a way to, to know uh, yeah, if you have an unconventional order parameter in a nodal state that very often you do. All right, great. So I think that now it's a very good time to make our second break. And what I would suggest is that we can come back at uh, yeah half past or yeah 35 uh, past 11, uh, and then again uh, get some air and rest a bit. But if you want to think about something now, what I would like to ask you is if you can identify which kind of superconducting order parameters these three terms belong. So yeah, see you in 15 minutes. At